The United States says Moscow could launch an attack on Ukraine at, quote, any point. Washington is stepping up diplomatic efforts to try and prevent a conflict. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in Kiev for talks with President Vladimir Zelensky. He'll also meet with Russian counterpart Sergei Lavrov later in the week and speak with the German, French and British foreign ministers. Russia has deployed more than 100,000 troops on the border with Ukraine, but denies it is planning an invasion. Well, I'm now joined by our Kiev bureau chief, Matthias Berlinger, uh, in the Ukrainian capital there. Matthias, uh, Blinken is in Kiev uh, to hold talk, talks with the Ukrainian uh, president. Uh, what can the Ukrainians expect from this visit? Well, that's hard to say. I mean, we've seen a flurry of activity, a lot of diplomatic activity in the last uh, few days. Uh, the German foreign minister was here on Monday. Yesterday there was a commission from Congress, and today it's the Secretary of State from the U.S. Um, all this is, of course, uh, to prevent a Russian attack and to uh, get diplomacy going as long as it can. It seems that the U.S and uh, foreign um, uh, secret services have decided that a Russian attack or an escalation is imminent and this activity is, of course, to prevent it from happening, hoping that as long as talks are going on, there will be no shooting. Uh, Matthias, uh, Blinken will go on to meet with his Russian counterpart on Friday. How much space is there still for diplomacy after a whole series of meetings between Western allies and Moscow, including Germany's Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock just yesterday, uh, failed to achieve anything? Well, what we can see is that Russia is engaging in this diplomacy. The problem is we do know what Putin's overall goal is. It is to extend or to re-establish uh, parts of the Soviet sphere of influence that the Soviet Union used to have and to bring Ukraine back into this sphere of, uh, of influence. But we do not know what his priorities are. Is this whole build-up, this military build-up, this uh, 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 scenario made to get the West to talk to him, or is he really planning to bring back Ukraine into his sphere of influence by force? This is the big question that they are trying to figure out. And uh, uh, from what Putin's tactics, what Putin's uh, uh, calculations are, will depend whether diplomacy at this point can still be successful or not. It is, of course, worth trying it. That's the consensus in Western countries and in Ukraine as well. So what's your feeling there on the ground? Ordinary Ukrainians, do they feel threatened? Kiev looks surprisingly calm in this situation. People are going about their daily business. Uh, we don't see panic buying of uh, groceries or we don't see uh, 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 exchange rates drop or anything. Um, people are waiting. People are used to being threatened here. This war has been going on for eight years now, uh, so people are prepared for a lot. And some people are also preparing for action in case Russia would attack. And I have met some of them. Matthias Böllinger there, DW Bureau Chief in Kiev. And some of these Ukrainian civilians that Matthias has met are joining up as reservists to help the military in the event of a Russian attack. For many, the experience could not be more different than their ordinary lives and day jobs. This is how Marta Yuskiv has been spending her weekends in the past few months. She has joined Ukraine's Territorial Defense Forces, a volunteer brigade designed to support the army in the hinterland in the case of an attack. Marta is 51 and has no prior military experience. All the stuff that you could just see on the movies or on the documentaries, you know, they seem very simple, but in general, when you started to do it, it's quite difficult because you need to know how to do it correctly, uh, not to be in danger for yourself and for your colleagues. So it's quite important skills. Very basic, but very important skills. Every Saturday, she swaps her suburban home for a training camp. During the week, she works from home for a company that conducts pharmaceutical studies. 
an idyllic life she shares with her family and more than a dozen stray cats she has taken in. It's almost impossible to imagine what will happen if I have to leave it, if I have to just uh, I mean, fight and it will be destroyed. It could happen. I'm trying to be ready for this because definitely I don't want to preserve this uh, on the price of being live under occupation. If war breaks out, these volunteer troops will work behind the lines to secure buildings, provide logistics to the army and possibly even deal with hostile infiltration. But there are questions about how effective these troops will be. Marta's commander, Denis Simiroch Orlik, is an architect. He doesn't have any prior military experience either. We are not servicemen who are on duty every day. We are civilians who have other jobs. But nevertheless, I have been training for three years now and it has already had quite an impact on me. One thing's for sure, the weekend warriors have attracted a lot of attention. Marta tirelessly explains her motivation to journalists from all over the world, even if that means that her face is now well known also to the enemy. It's important not to be scared, honestly, because I am in my country, I am not doing anything wrong, and I'm just trying to protect my country. I, so it's like truth on my side. Nobody doubts that Russia's troops are militarily superior to Ukraine's defense forces, but Marta and her fellow volunteers are determined to make an invasion as difficult as possible. Well, for more tonight, I'd like to welcome Jeremy Shapiro. He's the research director of the European Council on Foreign Relations. He's a former advisor at the U.S. State Department. Jeremy, it's good to have you on the program. Let me start by getting your read on this latest news that... Um, Secretary of State Blinken and Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov will meet this coming Friday in Geneva. What do you think? Well, I think it means that the diplomatic track is still open, which is uh, good news. But uh, as your report made very clear, there's a lot there, it's not clear that the two sides have gotten any closer together. They are really, I think, feeling each other out, threatening each other, um, demanding that that, the, that each side show their cards first, and both sides have been very reluctant to make any movement. But uh, if they want to avoid the worst outcomes, I think eventually they'll have to. And what do you make of the, the German rush to double down on diplomacy? I mean, former German Chancellor Merkel, she was, she was considered the Putin whisperer, if you will, in times of crisis. Do you think the new government with Chancellor Olaf Scholz, can they offer this type of reach and insight? Uh, it doesn't appear that they can do that yet. I'm not entirely clear that Angela Merkel was really able to do that when push came to shove. But certainly at the moment, the Russians seem very, very focused on the Americans, very focused on uh, the bilateral discussions. Uh, obviously, as you said, German Foreign Minister Baerbock was in uh, Moscow today, and you know, it's quite impressive for a new foreign minister to go into that lion's den and speak her mind in the way that she did. But I'm not really sure that that's where the game is. The game appears to be between the Russians and the Americans. And, and you know, there's been a lot of talk since the beginning of last week that what we've got here is a very Cold War esque setup here with the US and Russia having bilateral talks discussing the future of Europe. Eastern Europe, Ukraine, while the Ukrainians and the Europeans were not sitting at the table. Are we seeing that happen yet again here? It does seem to be the case. And uh, interestingly, um, that seems to be one of the Russian demands that, have already, that has already been met. Uh, they, miss, they seem to miss those Cold War days. I can't understand why. Uh, but they really do revel in this sort of idea of the U.S., and Russia as the superpower sitting together, deciding the fate of Europe and perhaps even the world. Uh, and the Americans have to a degree conceded that. They're very careful to say at every meeting, we won't decide anything without our allies, we won't decide anything about Ukraine without Ukraine, but they're having the meetings. Uh, and so I'm not sure what they're talking about if they're not talking about Ukraine. 
so um, it's, it seems like that is that to a degree is what hap- is what's happening. But at the same time, uh, I mean, relative to the Cold War, the borders have moved roughly a thousand kilometers to the east. And secondly, the Americans aren't giving in on anything. They're holding, uh, at least uh, until now, to the faith that their allies have put into them. Yeah. And, you know, we've got most of the European Union, we've got bipartisan um, support in the U.S. Congress, as well as from the Greens here in Germany, everyone in agreement that the Nord Stream 2 natural gas pipeline that links Germany and Russia should be killed. And despite hawkish language this week from the German foreign minister, Berlin refuses to move on this pipeline. Why do you think that is? Well, I think the pipeline is, uh, in the first instance, quite vital to the German energy concept. Uh, And secondly, they are hoping that they don't have to um, sacrifice it. It it seems very clear to me, and I think um, uh, the the chancellor was a little bit oblique, but reasonably clear today, that in the event of a sort of major Russian incursion, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline would very much be on the table. but uh, it seems to me that they've been taking the view for, for many years that this is an economic, uh, an economic project, and they're planning to stick to that view. I think this gets to the point that um, everybody is against what the Russians is do- are doing in the West, but nobody really wants to, to pay for the solution. And that's mm-hmm. to a degree why the Americans have ended up in that room alone. You know, Kiev wants the West to provide it with weapons to defend itself um, because the West is not going to go to war over Ukraine. We know that the UK is doing just that. It's providing weapons. You have written about Brexit Britain and its role in the world. Um, What is your read on Brexit Britain, or should I say global Britain, and this crisis over Ukraine? Yeah, the British role is very interesting. I think that the the British are, um, and the Johnson government particularly, given that it's in trouble at the moment at home, is very interested in making sure that it that it has a voice. And and I think in a in a way that's quite distinct with with what to what Germany is doing, they are really um, determined to sort of stand up and put some skin into the game so that they can have some voice at the table. And uh, I think they have a. At the moment, they have a better claim to that uh, than Germany does. It, you know, it's quite notable that um, that uh, Baerbock is in Moscow and she's giving a very strong moral message about human rights, about red lines. But then you sort of look behind at what's happening in Berlin and you're wondering, you know, in the first instance, does she really speak for the German government? And even to the degree that she does, what is Germany putting on the table in the way that the U.S. and the U.K. and a few others? are. Uh, when when Foreign Minister Baerbock was in Kiev, she specifically said, we are not going to send any weapons, uh, any weapons at all to uh, to Ukraine to defend them against Russia. So it's a little well, bit unclear, I think, to a lot of Germans' partners what these words mean. Well, that, isn't that that's, that's standard German policy, though, because of the German past, not to be sending weapons into a, a, a crisis area. Isn't Germany standing by um, what Joe Biden has promised, is to return principles and human rights to the core of foreign policy? I don't know what that means. Um, uh, the, 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 the problem here is that um, Ukraine, uh, Russia is being threatened. Russia is threatening Ukraine. Um, Germany has put down a principle that that kind of aggression is unacceptable. They use the word unacceptable very often. Sure. If unacceptable is, have, is to have any meaning, then you have to be willing to do something about it. Uh, you could have a lot of views as to what to do. Certainly the most obvious and clearest one, the one that the British and the U.S. at the moment are following, along many other steps, is to make Ukraine better able to defend itself, which puts some meaning to this word unacceptable and puts some meaning behind the principle that Uh, Foreign Minister Baerbock and many others are articulating. And if Germany isn't willing to do something like that, maybe it's not weapons to a conflict zone, but but it it has to be something, then uh, it's not clear to me what principles in international relations really mean. Yeah, a lot of people saying if you're going to talk the talk, you also have to walk the walk. Jeremy Shapiro, we appreciate your time and your insights tonight. I mean, come back and talk with us again. Thank you. Thank you.